everyone for those who don't know me and even if you do Reverend Mary chaplain in a local hospital and I'm so pleased to be spending Advent and however else long with each of you welcome to everyone in this building and also either at home or perhaps you're listening to the service during the week I am thankful that you are here we are here either in spirit or in body and that just this time that we can spend together to take time to be addressed and to worship together. So right now, let us listen and begin this worship with the prelude.
Please join me in the land acknowledgement. We are not the first peoples on this land, nor will we be the last. Teach us to build good soil and to become good ancestors. Please join me in the call to worship. And as we be continue in this time of worship together, I invite you to be present wherever you may be and to worship with us. Gather around. You are welcome here and you will hear good news. In a world where there are so many discouraging and negative voices, it is the God of encouragement who will speak to you today. So come in, relax, let your tiredness go away. Lift up your hearts and listen. Let us continue in worship together. So at this time, we'll be lighting our second Advent candle by Monica. And this week is peace. Good thing you can see. Please join me in the opening prayer on peace. Mighty God, send your Holy Spirit to speak peace, that the good news of this age and all ages may be proclaimed through your word, which stands forever. Light our hearts and minds, and that by the power of the Holy Spirit, our lives may reflect God's glory and the teaching he has given us. Amen. Please join, if Stan is able, then join in the opening hymn, Lift Up Your Heads, Almighty Gates, and 129. <laughs>
Please be seated. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Here ends the reading. just to set the stage just a little bit, the book Isaiah follows a prophet, not surprisingly, called Isaiah. What might be a little bit of a surprise is the book covers over a 200-year time period. Theologians believe there was at least three Isaiahs, three prophets called Isaiah, who all spoke God's word in visions and imagery. The words we heard this morning, since it was chapter 2, is the first Isaiah, and is bold and dramatic. He speaks of a vision which could give God's people, peoples from many cultures and beliefs hope. And I was reading something that talked about how Isaiah saw the word. So for some of us, we'll read things and it's like, oh, okay, this is nice. But for Isaiah, he saw, envisioned the words that God gave him. He spoke of a vision which could give God's people from many cultures and beliefs hope. So one of my favorite commentaries is called Feasting on the Word, and they're a group of books, and one of the writers talks about how the context of Isaiah 2 starts with to zero, and I'm not going to say this right, epiphalimic, just kind of go with me on that. <laughs> and so basically what it was is the northern kingdom of Israel and the Aramean kingdom of Damascus tried to force Judah, the smaller part, into an unwise alliance in opposition to the Assyrian Empire. Now, I don't know how many of you enjoy reading the Hebrew scriptures a lot, but if, as you go through there, you can see how kings are seldom willing to call on the prophets, let alone listen to them. But King Isaiah of the time is scared enough to make that call. Isaiah being known for bold, being bold and dramatic and trust in God even when there's challenges and times of loss for the people of God, he was not afraid to speak up to the king of that time. So here's an example. King comes to him wanting to know, well, you know what do we do, what's going on? Most kings 
And rulers, even today, look more for that political, that, okay, if you do A, B, C, then you'll have D come to pass. While Isaiah, being a prophet of God, instead of directly answering the king, Isaiah builds a vision of hope and trust in God, a change in the direction to one's life and individually and in the community they live. He doesn't speak of war, but instead of this highest mountain of God's protection, where people not just of one culture, but many run to it. People willing to listen not to human words, but God's and God's instruction. They are called to make peace, and we know that Isaiah was ready and many of the people. So Isaiah often speaks, and if we look at the history of the Hebrew-Israel people, this dream, and it includes all three Isaiahs, ebbed and flowed over time. The children of Israel at many different times in their history found themselves in captivity, found themselves struggling in drought and despair. Even now, we all look and we all can struggle with this idea of peace and hope when we look around ourselves. And yet, I believe on this journey, as in all our journeys in life, God, no matter what's going on in the world, God is always present with us. So in this case, as I mentioned, Isaiah is building this wonderful vision for God's people. One, two, in this 21st century, we can share in the different ways that our hearts can be comforted in times of struggle. So when you stop and think about it, because the words, I had someone last week say to me um, in my role as a chaplain, easy for you to say. We were speaking about something they were struggling with, and I stopped and I went, that's true. And it is easy for me to say, but I recognize that it can be out challenging to live in that life of being, allowing ourselves to be comforted and rested in God's love. So all the way back, as in all back into Isaiah's time to now, we can all seek God and God is present, and change will ultimately happen. For each of us, this is a challenge or a choice that we make. Who do we follow? Everyone has a choice. Who or what do we believe in? And then we're asked to remember Whatever may happen, or where that power seems to come from, there will be a time, as it says in Isaiah, when God's reign will be established for all humankind to see. God's power will last, not the world or the temple, but and understand that the temple that Isaiah referred to was more than just a location. It was a central point where God's presence went out from, where God's people came. And in verse 4, it talks about, He shall judge between the nations for many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift sword against nations, neither shall they learn war anymore. I got to chill what Monica was saying that as she read the scripture this morning. Because, and I guess growing up on Long Island, and I know y'all are even more farmers than Port Jeff, Mount Sinai, and Miller Place. I remember growing up, and we had you know, um, crops upon crops against crops. And we would have a, um, a friend of mine that recently passed away, his name is Harry. He would take us on his grandfather like generations and show us what a pruning hook looked like, at least going back a couple hundred years. So that was probably different than way back in the Hebrew Testament, but it definitely wasn't like what you saw in the fields. So it, it made it a little easier for me to imagine you taking swords, things that gave death, and with some work, you instead made it something that could give people life, provide food for them, and help them be a peaceful nation. So where does our hope lie? So for me, the hope lies with the one always there and present with us, God, 
And there's a story I read. I don't know how many people know who Father Henry Nowen was. Someone? So Henry Nowen was a wonderful priest, and he took care of a lot of people. He was a teacher. He um, worked with people that had disabilities. And he struggled with his own choices, decisions, world, just the world he lived in. And he was a great storyteller. And he talked about having hope and trust in the caption. Now, again, sometimes my stories kind of tell you with growing up on Long Island down that way. So who here remembers going to the circus as a child? Anybody? Yes. So do you remember the trapeze artist? Yes. That would always scare me. I was very thankful that there was a net underneath. Though in life, we don't always see one. So, Henry Nowage talked about his experience with um, the Raleigh brothers. They were flying trapeze artists, and they would go through Europe, and he was fascinated. He was fascinated with the courage of the person who would fly in the air and let go, and then wing themselves across the space in a circus tent. It's another part to that. So when Henry told the father of the Raleigh family of his admiration for the flying artist, the father responded, well, really, Henry, it's all about the catcher. That's where, right? Yeah, you, need, you need both parts, right? That's where you should look. It's up to the catcher to time the catch and be right there when the flyer comes. And in all of our lives, now and in the times of Isaiah, people seek something. And as people seek God, they can weave their sadness and joy in one story of many parts. And we realize that the one in our life, our capture God, is the one who can be trusted no matter what. No matter how high we might soar or how close to the ground we might get. And listening to those words of Isaiah, we can see even in the most dangerous of times, people are seeking to hear words of comfort, hope, and rest in the strength of God's presence. Even in the worst of times, there's hope. Hope of God's presence of God being that catcher in our life. Going back to verse 3, so when I was growing up, we would always be told things like, figures of speech, always watch for the figures of speech, and I'd be like, okay, what's that? So here in verse 3, it took me a while to figure out these things when I was younger, is their synonyms, and they are, he will teach us his ways, we will walk in his paths, and out of Zion will go forth the law, and the word of the Lord will come from Jerusalem. Ways, path, law, and word. All these things come from God, not the world we live in, but God. They illustrate the different ways that God teaches us, and that imagery is easier sometimes to hold in our minds. God is the speaker. And Isaiah, he saw that image. He saw that idea of the word being more than just things we say. And as we continue to travel through Advent, we can also see God's word incarnate. And again, the wisdom of the world tells us, oh no, you need strength, you need might. So another Francis, a Franciscan priest, Richard, Father Richard Ward once wrote, as long as you show up, the Spirit will keep working. That is why Jesus shows up in this world as a naked, vulnerable one, a defenseless baby. Talk about utter relationships. Naked vulnerability means I'm going to let you influence me. I'm going to allow you to change me. And throughout our life, we face challenges and powers and different things in our world. 
And when we reflect on Isaiah, we can also remember the words, O house of Jacob, Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And out of the darkness, light will come. And the light of the birth of the baby Jesus is something we will see again and again and hope in. And as we actively wait and watch and walk, we too can seek that mountain of God where we learn and listen to God's word. We can walk and like that trapeze artist, we can fly. We are free to fly and know that God is the catcher. God is our catcher and will always catch us again, no matter how high we might find ourselves soaring and at times how close to the ground we may find ourselves skimming. God, our catcher, will always be there. So let us take this time and fly. Amen. So join us now in the song. It's something to look forward to as we reflect and as we live in Advent. O come, O come, Emmanuel, number 119.
And also for those present here to remember that you can write a prayer if you would like me to say out loud and will be collected with the offering. And there will be in the pew holders for you. So now let us sit and let us be at peace.
God, we lift our prayers up to you. Those those sit in this room and those at home or a coffee shop, wherever people may be. And those prayers, even those prayers that are so private that we don't even utter them to ourselves that we know you are aware of and you hear. I thank you, God, for the prayers of all the people today, of their hearts, of their tribulations and of their times and of great joy. I thank you, God, for everyone we pray for each week that we find in our bulletin. I thank you for Ruthie Love. I thank you, God, for those in this world who face great physical challenges or wants of violence, that you are present with them in that journey. I thank you that we together can pray and that we together can sit and be in silence together. And at this time, God, that we can pray that prayer that your son taught his followers when they wondered, how do we pray? So please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, the Lord of heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in singing Alleluia. Hear God's story, number 330. <laughs>
Holy God, we give thanks for your creation, fragile, yet fruitful, enough for all. We give thanks that you call us in community, where love and justice may flourish, enough for all. We give thanks that you invite us on this Advent journey, awake, curious, longing to meet you. We sit out for you, our table of grace. You light our path one step at a time, beckoning us onto a way that offers us new eyes to explore the vision of the promised one, new senses to feel the heartbeat of the vulnerable one, new courage to wrap the share in the urgency of the ruler of peace. One more step, one more stretch, one more challenge. Takes us deeper into the mystery of your more than abundant life. A world healed, renewed, all nature, all peoples at peace. We give you thanks for sending us Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, whose life, death, and resurrection have become for us the way to find you, to know you, to join with you in creating your new heaven and your new earth. And we do all remember that night when Jesus gathered at a table with his friends in a time of struggle and fear and wondering what is happening. And he took the bread and he blessed it and gave it to them saying, Take and eat, for this is my body. And then after supper, and as you know what supper that can sometimes look at, he took a cup. And again, he gave God thanks. And he take, said, take this, all of you, and drink. We share this bread and this cup this morning, all of us together. Even if we're not in person, all of us, we are in spirit. We are one in unity. Come now, Holy Spirit God, and as you were present at creation, you are present now. And let these gifts of bread and cup become for us the bread of life and the cup of blessing. And as you were sent, and as you are always there to accompany us on our journey, you are present now and you transform us as we share the sacred meal by the sharing of this bread and this cup in one body of Christ. Come, everything is ready. Come and share the sacred meal.
And now let us share in the cup of the new covenant that Jesus offered that night so long ago. Please join me in offering the communion prayer of thanksgiving. Holy, welcoming God, we thank you for this meal that proclaims that you should be given. We thank you for this meal where a little is enough to change our lives, where a little is more than enough to feed those whose hearts yearn for communion and communion. May this bread and fruit of the vine nourish us so we may grow in faith and knowledge that in you we are one. Amen. And please join in the hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth, number 677.
And God, as we prepare to leave this place of sanctuary, that we take your peace with us. That we know that we make a difference in this world we live in. And that you love each one of us. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm.